The topic for today's roundtable discussion is AFPAC, Terrorism and Geopolitics. Before we actually go on the discussion, I'll give a little bit of introduction to Council for Strategic Affairs. CSA imparts education in the field of international relations. The Council fosters discussion, dialogue, and debate on geopolitical issues. The Council encourages strategic studies in general to raise the level of awareness of citizens. The CSA condemns terrorism in all its forms and anywhere in the world, and that is very, very important view of today's discussion. CSA also aims to contribute towards world peace and prosperity. Few of our activities involved a monthly roundtable discussion on second Saturday of each month at 10 a.m. Eastern Daytime. We have a monthly guest lecture by a domain expert on fourth Saturday of each month. Council for Strategic Affairs also organizes symposia, meetings, and conferences. The Council promotes publication of articles on geopolitics and related subjects, and the Council has a summer internship program for college students. So today's roundtable discussion is on AFPAC, terrorism and geopolitics, and we have three distinguished panel members, Mr. Francois Gauthier, a journalist, Professor Walter Anderson, who is a scholar of international relations and an academician, and Ms. Arzu Kazmi, a journalist. So you will be seeing our panelists fairly soon. This is Francois Gauthier. Francois Gauthier was a political correspondent in South Asia during 10 years for Le Figaro, France's largest daily. He is currently the editor-in-chief of the Paris-based La Revue de La Indi, published by La Hart Martin. He has written several books on India, including Shri Shri Ravi Shankar, A Guru of Joy. Uh, his most important book is An Entirely New History of India. Francois is also building a museum of Indian history in Pune in India. He is married to an Indian lady and spends his time between Pondicherry, Pune, and Delhi. Our second distinguished speaker is Professor Walter Anderson. Professor Walter Anderson earned his PhD in political science from the University of Chicago. He was a program director at John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. He retired in 2019 for Johns Hopkins as senior adjunct professor of South Asia studies. Uh, you know, Paul H. Nietzsche School of Advanced International Studies. He was also faculty at Tongji University in Shanghai in China. He has taught comparative politics at the College of Worcester before joining the United States Department, State Department as a political analyst for South Asia specializing in India and Indian Ocean. He has serious, you know, connection of heart with India because he's married to an Indian lady. As part of his fieldwork, he has lived in India for four work, uh, four years from late 1960s through early 1970s. And our third speaker is Arzu Kazmi, who is a journalist since 2011, a political analyst and columnist. She is from Pakistan and she has a video and TV show called Point of View. She is very active on social media and sometimes writes under a hashtag called Bheja Pry. So this is the area of AFPAC and it shows the basis of jihadi groups based on Pakistan-Afghanistan border, multiple jihadi groups, and again shows the geography of AFPAC in Indian subcontinent. 
the neologism AFPAC was coined during Obama presidency around 2008-2009, possibly by Richard Holbrook. The term was has entered into lexicon of geopolitics and has made clear to the world that the primary fronts for global war on terrorism lie both in Afghanistan and Pakistan. This neologism has reinforced the message that the problems of Islamic religious extremism and the resulting terror, terror infrastructure and problems in these two countries are intertwined. So in other words, this region is the fountainhead of global terrorism. Ironically, a former Pakistani Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto once called Pakistan as a frontline state against terrorism, while it was the fountainhead of terrorism. A late Pakistani dictator by name Ziaul Zia Haq envisaged a union of Pakistan and Afghanistan to provide strategic depth to Pakistan. So Pakistan's support for jihadi terrorism and Taliban and Al-Qaeda is part of this imperialistic project that seeks to dominate Indian subcontinent and whole of South Asia. It's interesting, today is September 10th, just one day before September 11th, when a major carnage a terrorist event happened on U.S. soil, perpetrated from both Afghanistan and Pakistan, and that's why we are discussing having today's discussion. A few housekeeping rules. Kindly mute yourself to avoid noise interference. Please change your cell phone setting to vibration mode. Please do not interrupt our esteemed speaker when they are speaking. Only the members of audience who identify themselves openly will be allowed to ask questions. We do not allow any anonymous questioners. And please send all your questions to the chat function. We do not allow you to you know, hold the platform. Your questions will be read by me as moderator. Kindly be precise and specific in asking a question. Don't send comments in the form of a monologue. We don't expect a lecture from you. We have distinguished panel members. Question has to be very specific. And lastly, like all the programs of CSA, this event is going to be recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel. So you will have access to it later on. Without further ado, I am going to invite our first distinguished panelist, Francois Gauthier. Francois, the floor is yours, please. Please go ahead. Can, can you unmute yourself, please? You are muted. Yeah, am I audible? Yes, you are audible now. Okay, thank you, Dr. Adityanji. Um, you know what interests me in your in the title of your of your of the talk today, the word geopolitics. Now, as a journalist who's lived in India for a long time, <clears throat> um, I have come to uh, understand that India is at the crossroads of a very important geopolitics game. It is not only because uh, Islamic terrorism doesn't only come from Pakistan. Of course, it does come from Pakistan. But it also comes from Afghanistan. It comes from Indonesia even. <clears throat> it comes from Qatar. There is a, you know, there are, the Qatar is funding a lot of Islamic uh, bodies. It is not very well known. But uh, I, have, I have the statistics with me, but I, I won't bother you with the statistics. So India is at the crossroads. The, if the West is looking for a partner in Asia, it is India. Because India is a crossroads not only of Islamic terrorism, of course, coming from Pakistan, but also <clears throat> from the Indians, from, from the Chinese thirst for hegemony, because uh, Pakistan became more dangerous than 9-11 because the Chinese have increased their support of Pakistan, both military, financial, uh, you know, they're doing a Silk Road uh, through the Himalayas uh, from Xinjiang that crosses uh, Pakistani uh, held uh, territories and comes to Gwadar, <clears throat> a port in Pakistan uh, from which 
uh, the Chinese goods will flood the world. So, so to my mind, uh, it is uh, the West needs to recognize the importance of India as a buffer, not only against Islamic terrorism, but again, Islamic terrorism sponsored by China. Um, I would like to say that uh, China has, is not only supporting Pakistan, it is supporting also Nepal, uh, where you know, on and off there are Maoist or Maoist pro-government, is supporting Sri Lanka, which is heavily indebted to, uh, to China, and recently there was a Chinese spy chip which came into uh, into the Sri Lankan port. It is supporting Burma, of course. Uh, it is supporting Pakistan. It is supporting Bangladesh. So, India is encircled by both Islamic terrorism and also by the Chinese iron hand. So, I have been writing for a long time and hoping that the West, particularly the United States, recognize the fact that uh, India is that democratic nation, pro-Western, liberal, powerful, uh, that can act as a buffer against Islamic terrorism. But I see that uh, you know, the, the Biden administration is continuing to uh, financially uh, sponsor Pakistan. I see that uh, you know, the Chinese are very clever. They, they encroach upon Indian territories, and then uh, they retreat a little bit, and then talks happen and the Chinese pretend to be friendly, and then again they slap India in the face, India which is never never ready uh, for the slaps. So, so, so what bothers me is the, is the geopolitics of India, that uh, not only the West is not understand, my own country, France, is not aware of India's position as a geostrategic partner. Not at all, I mean, not at all. I mean, I don't know how it doesn't jump into their eyes uh, uh, that uh, Islamic terrorism, India has been facing Islamic terrorism long before the United States, much, much before the United States. There have been three wars with Pakistan, four if you count Kargil, and I was I was a witness as, of Kargil because I was a journalist then, I was a reporter then. Uh, and then uh, India has faced, there have been, of course, less terrorist attacks in the last 10 years, but there have been numerous terrorist attacks on on temples, on the Akshavan temple in Gujarat. Uh, there have been, the, of course, the Mumbai attacks, you know, which came from Pakistan. So, in spite of this, the West continues to uh, support Pakistan, thinking that it is, as you said, very rightly, it is a, a, a frontline state against Islamic terrorism. It is a moderate Islamic state. I don't understand how there are so many experts in the United States, how nobody is able to take the tell the different presidents from you know Obama to uh, Bush to uh, the present one that uh, you need to stop supporting Pakistan and you need to start supporting India in a much bigger way. Of course, the United States has differences with India. Of course, India has faults. I mean, I'm aware of India's faults very much. Very much I'm aware of India's faults. But at the same time, as I said, India is a democracy, uh, pro-Western, where every persecuted religious minority in the world has found refuge all over the age, from the Parsis uh, in, in Iran to the Armenians to the Tibetans today. Uh, every every uh, religious persecuted found refuge in India and practiced their religion really in India. Yet the United States continue to say that India is a country where human rights are not respected. I, a white man, you know, Catholic born, Catholic educated, living in India here, a journalist. Um, I have always felt that uh, it's an incredibly free country. Incredibly, incredibly. I'm associated with Oroville, which is near Pondicherry, uh, where there are so many Westerners. Only in India, such a crazy project would happen. So to combat your Islamic terrorism, it is more dangerous now because it is sponsored, funded, and supported by the Chinese. As you know, every time uh, the United Nations wants to condemn some of the some of the uh, Islamic uh, outfits in Pakistan, uh, China was veto power, vetoes that thing, and it, it never happens. Every time, you know, uh, India is proposed as a member of the in, uh, National Security Council of the UN, China vetoes it. So China is the, for me, beyond Islamic terrorism, beyond Pakistan, because Pakistan is also a country which is imploding because it unleashed 
so much terrorism onto the world that there is a karma. You know, there's a karma and terrorism come back to them. You know, Sunnis and uh, Sunnis and uh, uh, Akira and Shah are killing themselves. Ahmadis are persecuted. Of, of course, minorities are persecuted in Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan is facing floods uh, at the present moment, uh, terrible floods. So Pakistan's economy is in the shambles, I believe. So yes, Pakistan is the fountain of terrorism. At the same time, it, it, it's it's a bit of a has been in my mind. You know, I mean, if India has an enemy, it's China. If tomorrow there is a war, I do not think there will be a war with Pakistan because Pakistan, as I said, is weakened. Uh, it has a limited nuclear. Uh, uh, you know, uh, ranch uh, uh, missiles with limited supply, and India has much more. So Pakistan would be wiped out of the face of the earth in the case of a nuclear war. But a war with China, with Pakistan as a second front, Pakistan opening a second front uh, to uh, you know to win India. Yes, that is very possible, and uh, I have been thinking for a long time that the Chinese will have a an extreme superiority complex towards India, thinking that Indians are inferior beings, uh, will, as they did in 1962, uh, with the help of Pakistan and Islamic terrorism, uh, teach a lesson to India, uh, teach a lesson to India that you, know, you cannot, uh, you know, you cannot take it for granted. You have, you know, you have given refuge to the Dalai to Tibetans. You are you know, questioning our body. So, so if there is a war. Uh, it will be with China, uh, with the support of Pakistan. Now, how to make you know how to make the West understand the precarious position of India, which is, as I said, surrounded by by enemies, not only Pakistan, of course Afghanistan. I, I believe that the Indian government uh, even talks with the Taliban in uh, in, uh, in 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 Afghanistan, but I, I would not trust these people, uh, even though they look to. Have become more moderate. Uh, we see that the Sharia that uh, is still very much in uh, ruling Afghanistan. We see that women have been, you know, uh, taken away from all posts uh, and are not to appear in public. Uh, and uh, we see that Kashmir, because we we need to talk a little bit about Kashmir here. Uh, now Kashmir, I have covered Kashmir extensively. Uh, the uh, uh, Pakistan has been the fountainhead of terrorism in Kashmir, of separatism in Kashmir, from the time uh, where I, I, I began to go there uh, in the late 80s uh, till uh, until now, of course. You know, I, I, I don't know how many of you know the line of control that separates uh, Indian uh, Kashmir to, to, to Pakistan and Kashmir, but it's a very wide border. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to guard. So, so Indian Kashmiri Muslim go to Pakistan, uh, get trained, get weapons, come back with uh, with uh, fans, and unleash terror there. So nobody speaks much about Kashmir, and indeed Kashmir today has been also thanks to social media. You know the Kashmiri uh, Muslims uh, uh, are portraying themselves as victims, but that was there when it started. They they you know. They, they chased out by violence, they killed, you know, the Kashmiri Hindus who have been there for generations and had never done anything to them. Uh, the 350,000 Kashmiri Hindus who fled the valley of Kashmir, because people are very ignorant about Kashmir. There is Ladakh, which is mainly Buddhist, there is Jammu, which is still at the thin Hindu majority, and then you have the valley of Kashmir, which had, at the beginning of the 20th century, about a million Hindus. and then today there are hardly a handful left. So I was a witness of the ethnic cleansing of the remaining Hindus of Kashmir uh, with the support of Pakistan. And uh, so Kashmir is very important. It's very important that uh, the West supports Kashmir. Even my country, France, for that matter, they don't understand that the terrorism that Pakistan and Afghanistan indirectly uh, continues to unleash uh, and to Kashmir, into Kashmir uh, is uh, something which is unacceptable. I mean, we, I don't think India questions uh, the fact that France uh, fought to re retain Corsica, which is, as you know, Corsica is an island off the coast of France, uh, which was once Italian. So there, there had been, uh, like there was in Kashmir, though in a much, much, much less violent way. 
uh, 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 separatism in Corsica uh, in the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, early 20th century, and uh, the French clamped down and never, no, so India never questioned the fact that uh, Corsica is part of France. Now, why should France or the United States, for that, for that matter, question the fact that you know Kashmir is, is India? I mean, it's been the, the seat of Shivaism. Shivaism was born there. I don't know how many of you, um, probably all of you, because <laughs> you, you all have Indian names. I, I you know are familiar with uh, Shivaism. Also, once it was the seat of uh, of Buddhism. There were Buddhist kings in the in, in Kashmir. So there is no doubt in my mind that uh, you know Kashmir and Kashmir is very important because uh, you know there is China. You know the actual thing. There is China. There is Afghanistan. There is uh, there is Russia. The uh, the the Muslim held. Uh, uh, breakaway states from, from the Soviet Union, which are, you know, not far from Kashmir. So geopolitically, and we, we're speaking about geopolitics here, Kashmir is extremely important to, you know, the, the world needs to support India in Kashmir, recognize it, you know, it's, it's right over Kashmir, the tot totality of Kashmir for that matter. And, uh, and understand that Kashmir is, uh, for India, is very important. You know, India lost Tibet, or the, uh, lost Tibet. Tibet was a buffer between uh, China and India, and Mao Zedong was a very intelligent man, you know, and a ruthless man, and he understood that taking over Tibet, you know, he could swoop down upon India very easily, which happened in 1962. The, the, you know, the Chinese came from above, the Indian army, because Nehru didn't think that an army was necessary, uh, was ill-prepared, it was winter, and uh, the Chinese you know, swept down to the plains till Assam, they could have gone to Delhi actually, but they themselves thought, okay, the lesson is enough, we, now we will withdraw. Now, if India loses Kashmir, you know, again, you have the enemy, uh, that is the Chinese, the Pakistan, the, the, the Afghans, you know, that can swoop down upon India from another front. So, I am sad, you know, because I have been, I have been fighting, I have been writing, I have been books and articles and doing talks like that you know, for years and years. And I see there's a little difference in, in my own country, in France, in the understanding of the economic and political importance of India against Islamic terrorism and more generally as a buffer against not only Islamic terrorism, but against Chinese hegemony, not only on the, uh, you know, on the plains and the mountain, but also in the seas, uh, between the Chinese Sea and the Indian Ocean, the, the Chinese are controlling everything. And uh, except for the uh, for the Americans, you know, who from time to time send a you know uh, aircraft carrier or you know or, or overflow the Spratis Island, nobody says anything. Nobody nobody is contesting the fact that China is controlling a very important passageway, you know, to the Indian Ocean and then you know to to the rest of the world. So. In my country, France, I, I fought so much, you know, for the politics and the bureaucrats and the businessmen to understand that, that they understand the importance of India. That not only they need to, you know, invest economically in India because they are not investing as uh, compared to China. The, the French are investing ten to twenty times more in China than in India. Of course, China is easier because it's uh, in dictatorship, and you know, you can root out have one million people to make a dam or. A highway, but uh, India is a democracy, so in the long run, India has a much better bet, not only for investment, but as a buffer, you know, as a geopolitical buffer. So I've been fighting for long, but I find that th there is little difference that the French still look at India in a soft way, you know, Ch chicken tandoori and, uh, you know, Bharat Natyam and, you know, and Bollywood, you know, it's so sad, you know, I, I'm okay, I'm. You know, I practice some yoga, you know, I'm not uh, depressed, but it's depressing actually, because uh, there's little understanding in the West of the geopolitical importance of India against not only Islamic terrorism, but Chinese hegemony. And, and uh, it, it needs to come, it needs to come. And I think it will come from the United States as usual, because whatever you say about them, uh, you know, they, they are they are the pioneers. They always been the pioneers. Huh? So to come back to Pakistan, I went to Pakistan many times. Uh, actually, Pakistan has uh, you know compared to India, it has many virtues. Actually, you know, the politicians are more accessible. You know, the people are 
quite friendly. Uh, it, but uh, it, it is, you know, it, it, it's believed that Islam is the ultimate truth. And I think it shares this with most Muslims in the world, unfortunately, that any Muslim in the world, whether it's Pakistani or Indian, feel that my religion comes first and then my nationality comes second. So this is the tragedy of, of Islam today, whether it is in France or in uh, or in uh, in India or in Pakistan, is that uh, nationality comes second. The first comes the religion, and the religion, of course, you know, the religion as it is practiced in Pakistan and Afghanistan and many other countries in the Gulf dates to the Middle Age. So, so it, it is still okay for a Pakistani uh, to kill a kafir because they believe that Indians, Hindus particularly, are idol worshippers and they, they need to be killed. So it is very easy and they feel that it is not something that not, not, they're not committing a sin, they're not committing a murder, they're doing their duty. So, so, but the, the, the West doesn't understand that, you know, the West doesn't want to see that. Neither in France, in my country, where they have the same problem of a, of a, of a strong now, uh, you know, Muslim minority, very educated now, many of them very educated, but they still feel, even though they may be highly educated or they may be, you know, they're top in their singers and uh, writers and poets, you know, they still feel that Islam is the ultimate truth. So the problem with Pakistan is Islam, and uh, the West needs to understand that. But I know that, uh, Dr. Aditanji, that you, you think I'm going away from my subject, but Pakistan is a has been. You know, I'm not going to go soft on that. Pakistan is a has been. It is not the main enemy. You know, uh, Indians keep, uh, and including you know Mr. Modi and his ministers, they keep harping on Pakistan as the enemy. But Pakistan is not the enemy. Pakistan is, you know, is with a weak nation, with a bankrupt uh, economy, and infighting each other, killing each other. You know, now having floods and begging the world for help. Uh, Pakistan is not the danger. The danger is China. Okay, Pakistan held, held by China is a danger still, but the danger to India is China. You know? And, and you know, the Indian leadership refuses to understand that. They, again, you know, the, the media keeps saying Pakistan is but it's not true. And, and the Chinese are much cleverer than the Pakistanis because they pretend to be friends and then they stab you in the back. So again, now I see that Mr. Modi now uh, has, uh, you know, uh, the, his government is going to help, uh, help uh, talks with the, the Chinese for the border issues. And the Chinese will be clever. They will pretend that, yes, yes, we're going to withdraw, and yes, we are friends. And they will start again next time. It has happened a hundred times, and it's still happening again. So I'd like to conclude my talk by saying, yes, geopolitically, India is extremely important to the world, not only because of Islamic terrorism, but because of Islamic terrorism sponsored by China. And yes, the main enemy is not Pakistan, but China, and China is the real enemy of India. And in terms of geopolitics, the West needs to support India because of China. Thank you. Thank you, Francois, for a very fresh geopolitical perspective. We'll come back to it when we have discussion and question and answer. But you have really hit the nail on the horn, uh, on the head. I am going to invite our next speaker, who is Professor Walter Anderson, who is also an India and South Asia expert. And as I had introduced him, that he was Professor of International Relations, South Asia Studies at Johns Hopkins University. Professor Anderson, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, CSA, um, and uh, yourself for organizing this very important meeting, which is, as you say, on the eve of the remembrance of 9-11 in this city, which I remember quite well, because I was actually working in the State Department on the day that that attack happened. Uh, and I recall, kind of somewhat humorously, is that the announcement system had no, they had set announcements, but they had none saying the city was potentially under attack. So what they said is that there's a flood in the basement. Everybody should get out. That was the only thing that they had that was available. And so people got out on that day. Um, also, I want to sort of just correct something you said in the introduction. Actually, I've lived in India for much more than four years. Uh, uh, I, I served at the embassy, as you may know, um, 
and uh, even before that as a student. And then I go every year. My wife is an Indian. She has a factory in Gurgaon. And uh, we go every year. In fact, I was just there for four months. Uh, and Dr. Adichenji, we have to meet when I'm next there, uh, which should be just a few months from now. So we'll organize some opportunity to meet each other. Um, as I mentioned, we're a day away from 9-11. This city, Washington, D.C., uh, is filled with events taking place tomorrow. And I'm involved in a few of them where many of the questions that were just raised will be discussed as well. Uh, but what I plan to do in my comments today is to focus on the western reaches of South Asia, Afghanistan and Pakistan, and explain why I think uh, the threat of terrorism is growing, a growing threat in the region. Um, the area is, uh, the western reaches are politically unstable economically destitute. I just saw in the press this morning that up to one third of Pakistan may be underwater or threatened by water, uh, which is a blow to its already weak economy and subject subject to revived terrorist activities in part because of the first two, the first two issues, um, economic and political. And that revival as the previous threatens India, but it threatens the US and many other countries as well. Uh, India is the only stable country in South Asia, and it is uh, economically growing country. In fact, India has the fastest growth rate in the world among major countries at some 8% go down. But nevertheless, uh, it's charging ahead economically. And therefore, it's of growing importance, uh, both strategically, as the previous speaker mentioned, and also as a counter to terrorism, which I will focus on. Uh, I'll focus on the terrorism aspect of it. Um, it uh, the, so let, let me focus now on the, the subject at hand, which is Afghanistan, Pakistan, terrorism. The, the victory of the Taliban in 2021 and the chaotic withdrawal of the U.S. and NATO troops highlighted the danger of a revived terrorist threat uh, in South Asia. And a number of the specific things only exacerbated that situation. The jails in Af Afghanistan were thrown open, releasing many radicals bent on defeating what they consider their enemies and the enemies of the faith. Second is availability of arms, because many arms were left behind by the retreating NATO forces and by the prior Afghan government. And third, enthused by the Taliban victory, there's been a growing trickle of radicals to Afghanistan and to a lesser extent to Pakistan, especially in the Middle East. And some have said, though I haven't seen any, maybe someone could discuss about it, some have actually been trickling into India as well. There's similarly revived activism of radicalism in Pakistan, especially the Pakistan Taliban, the Turiki Taliban Pakistan, uh, sometimes with cross-border assistance from the Taliban in Afghanistan. Even though the Taliban leadership in Afghanistan had pledged to stop such assistance, the, que the question is whether such help uh, to compatriots across the border is deliberate or is it the result of bureaucratic chaos so prevalent in Afghanistan. Now, groups like Al-Qaeda, Islamic State, have revived in Afghanistan. Judged by the multiple reports of sharply increased number of incidents since mid-2021, uh, mid when the Taliban took control of Kabul and the rest of the country. And the Islamic State, in particular, poses a threat both to the Taliban and in Afghanistan and to the Pakistani government citing both as insufficiently Islamic. Al-Qaeda, for its part, operates with comparative freedom in Afghanistan, witnessed by the killing of Ayman al-Zarahiri, head of the organization, in his posh home in central Kabul, and who was reportedly under the protection of Khalil Haqqani, a radical selected to be in charge of Kabul. And Indians are rightly concerned about a revival or strengthening of links between the terrorist groups in Kashmir, i.e. the Jaish Muhammad and the Lashk e Tiber, and groups like Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State. They provided assistance in the past, and are probably doing so at a limited scale now, and may do so even more in the future. 
So my basic proposition is that revolutionary radicalism is again taking root in South Asia, and it's not likely to go away because of structural problems in the western reaches of the subcontinent. The threat, as I mentioned, is most obvious for India because of the contested Kashmir situation and because the Modi government is perceived as a threat to Islam. I think there are four major structural reasons that account for the likely long-term threat of terrorism from the region. One is the institutional weaknesses of Afghanistan and Pakistan. Second is the distribution uh, disagreement over power distributions among ethnic groups in multi-ethnic Pakistan and multi-ethnic Afghanistan. Third is regional differences regarding sovereignty and security. And fourth is a sense of, a, of eventual victory due to the Taliban, which I've already mentioned before, and hence that trickle of enthusiasts going into the region to join what they think will be a eventually victorious struggle. Now, let me start with Afghanistan in this. The Taliban, um, like many revolutionary groups, have not been effective rulers or able to provide for basic needs. Hence, the virtual collapse of the economy and the growing flight of desperate Afghans. Pakistan has even felt the need to tighten up rules regarding immigration from Afghanistan. It already has uh, over 2 million Afghans who live there, and it's in many ways, it's, it's not able financially or otherwise to take many more. Uh, yeah. Also, uh, the priority accorded the Taliban to traditional religious values, such as hindering, if not excluding, women from broad, broad swaths of the workforce in education above the primary level. And this is a policy that denies the country the talents of some one half its population and makes international recognition unlikely. And that includes access to over $7 billion in overseas holdings as well as economic assistance, which the country desperately needs. There is an internal debate among the Taliban over whether and how to conduct or adopt liberal changes that would make, that would make economic assistance possible. There are, primary, there are pragmatic leaders, such as Deputy Prime Minister Abdul Baradar, willing to compromise. More liberal on gender issues, for example, in part because of the aim of reclaiming overseas assets. Uh, at the same time, there are radicals such as the Haqqani family, which has responsibility for security of Kabul that are opposed. And the, from what I read, the vast majority of people who are from rural Patan villages in, in Afghanistan are also opposed to any compromises on basic religious issues and, and cultural issues. The denial of education to girls is not a religious issue. And is nowhere supported by Islam. It is a cult, it is a traditional Patan issue, uh, which they have pushed. Now, one possibly positive development over the past decades decades is that many senior Taliban leaders, like Baradar, have experienced dealing with the realities of international politics. The question is the opposition of a large number of leaders, and almost certainly most of the troops, who seem the upper hand now in addressing this issue. So I don't expect significant changes to happen in Afghanistan regarding such issues as the education of women. There are also simmering between various ethnic groups in Afghanistan, and this is particularly the case between predominantly Shia Hazara ethnic group and the largely Sunni Pushtun groups that lead the Taliban. Rural-based uh, Patans dominate the Taliban fighting forces everywhere, and I'll talk more about those ethnic problems in a few minutes. Now, let's turn to Pakistan on that first issue. Pakistan military dominated by a largely Punjabi officer corps. Awful uh, always has its hands on the scales and uh, uh, episodically has intervened in Pakistan politics when it feel, felt the situation was getting out of hand. That, of course, distorts the and an ability to work out compromises, especially where the military interests are involved. The situation generates period unrest, and the political system, as the political system, cannot adequately address 
popular discontent. The military in Pakistan has always viewed itself as the guardian of the straight state, and thus periodically intervened in the political process, including long periods of martial law, when it judged civilian politicians unable to protect the state from internal discontent, a situation aggravated by the outside military, outsized military role in domestic politics. Beside issues of domestic security, large swaths of policy are at all times determined by the military, i.e. nuclear weapons, regional relations, especially relations with India, the military itself. As the late scholar of Pakistan Stephen Cohen once wrote, the military in most countries serves the state. In Pakistan, the state serves the military. The second point about is the, the disagreements over the distribution of power in multi-ethnic states of Afghanistan and Pakistan as providing an opening for the growth in radicalism and terrorism. Pakistan and Afghanistan are both multi-ethnic states where one ethnic group dominates politically and militarily. The Pashtun in Afghanistan and the Punjabis in Pakistan. Though neither is a majority and neither constitutes the economic elites of the country. And I think this has generated periodic ethnic and class discontent among minority groups in these two states. Traditional rural Pashtun culture has shaped the Taliban and its views on Islam in Afghanistan. And it is a, a view that is unlikely to budge or compromise to any major extent, which is a problem. To a certain extent, but lesser, is the situation is also true for Punjabis in Pakistan. Afghanistan differs from Pakistan in that it has several minority groups who have strong kinship ties outside the country. Pakistan is not devoid of such, such linkages entirely. For example, the Baluchi speaking majority in Pakistan's huge Western province of Baluchistan has links to the Baluchi across the border in Iran. They uh, across the border in, in Afghanistan and Iran. They have been in virtual revolt against the central authorities since independence were denying them the, uh, the, the riches of mineral resources uh, and energy. As to foreign linkages in Afghanistan, they are far more and far more significant. The Tajiks have ties to Tajikistan, the Uzbeks with Uzbekistan. The Tajiks speak a the Uzbeks a Turkic language. Both very different languages, which has strong links to the Indo-European languages of South Asia, like South Asia and Hindi. These countries and these countries are concerned by the growing radicalism of the Taliban. The economic and somewhat more moderate elites in both countries belong to neither ruling group. And this is important to keep in mind. For Pakistan, the economically dominant groups tend to be Sindhis and Sarai, 31% of the population, and the Mahaja immigrants from India, another 5%. For Pakistan, for Afghanistan, it's the Tajiks who are 27%. The discontent of the minority groups in Afghanistan has led to the formation has led to the formation of the Northern Alliance in the late 1990s in the 1990s to oppose the Pashtu dominated Taliban. A similar effort is beginning to take shape today, but it does not pose a yet a security threat to the Taliban. The inherent instability of Pakistan has produced, first in the colonial period and now a centralizing tendency in governance and the consequent strengths on the democratic process. It is not therefore surprising that the bureaucracy in Pakistan and the military have long had an alliance based on shared interests. Afghanistan, of course, is devoid of, of the democratic process and will be for, you know, in, 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 in indeterminate length of time. This centralizing provides discontent, an object of direct hostility, but a favorable environment in which to build up a terrorist infrastructure. Let me say a few things uh, about, in, in closing, about the regional differences as sources of the growth of terrorism. The most obvious, the radical Pakistan teller, uh, terrorist uh, uh, groups, the TTP, which whose support is centered in the formal tribal agency in the border area of Pakistan, majority areas of West Pakistan. It, it now receives some support from across the border and the reported level of violence since the Taliban victory 
in Pakistan's uh, West, uh, as well as in Afghanistan, is dramatically increased. There are reports that this violence is spreading beyond its ethnic Pathan base, helped by radical mosques and madrasas elsewhere in Pakistan. But there is another source of discontent, in which almost certainly lends support to Afghan to terrorist groups. Afghanistan does not accept the long drawn line that separates the two countries and insists that the large Pathan area seized from Afghanistan in the 19th century by, by the British colonial government as part of the big game between Tsarist Russia and Imperial Britain is invalid. That Pashto speaking areas have long, and they have long argued is legitimately Afghan, and the Taliban believe that as well. There have been periodic swells of support among tribal minority areas of Afghanistan, Tajik and Turkmen, for cooperation with compatriots. And these countries, Central Asian countries, as well, a more moderate form of Islam. In the 1990s, the Central Asian states provided support to the anti Taliban Northern Alliance. They now are in a wait to see move. As, uh, as is so much of the world, to determine how to handle the current Taliban situation. The other major contested area is Indian Afghanistan, which the first speaker referred to, uh, Indian Kashmir, which is where radical groups consider uh, an area that they need to quote unquote liberate, and which has a history of support from kindred groups in Pakistan and Afghanistan. But beyond that, beyond the scope of my comments here, and perhaps we will discuss it in the general discussion. Now, my yeah. point is that terrorism is a threat to South Asia. It's a threat that's real now. It's likely to grow, and for the structural reasons that I mentioned. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Anderson, for a very fascinating and detailed, uh, you know, presentation uh, of threat of terrorism from both Pakistan and Afghanistan because of their multi-ethnic status kind of thing. Our third speaker has not joined. So before taking questions, I will make a few comments because we have a couple of minutes. So in order to fill for the third speaker, uh, in 1990s, there was a book published by Samuel Huntington on the clash of civilizations and making of the world, remaking of the world. And when that book came, uh, most of the doyens of geopolitics and international relations actually decried and denounced Samuel Huntington. Uh, I think it was against the woke philosophy of political correctness. But I think the idea Samuel Huntington proposed and discussed, I think we are seeing them in implementation. And here I'm going to bring Francois back into this discussion when he said that the global terror threat actually emanates from China. And China is in alliance with Pakistan and Afghanistan and West needs to understand that. The West did not understand the threat of jihadi terrorism till 9-11 happened. Till 9-11 happened, everything was said law and order situation. When India was under assault of, assault of jihadi terrorism, the State Department mandarins will always say this is a law and order problem when India talked about cross-border terrorism. They did not wake up when there was first attack on World Trade Center in 1990, I think two or three, in the basement of the building, there was a van packed with explosives. They did not wake up when Ramzai Yusuf, a Pakistani intelligence agent, was captured from Manila and Philippines and brought to United States and he gave the blueprints that there will be 20 simultaneous attacks by planes from East Coast and West Coast 
on U.S. infrastructure and buildings. Nobody, you know, took that as the reality, but he did give this information to the CIA. And lo and behold, in 2001, on September 11th, when these attacks did happen, according to the same plan of using civilian aircraft to at least crash into four U.S. important buildings, later on, the National Security Advisor, Condoleezza Rice, was on record to say, nobody believed that this would happen. Nobody knew this was going to happen. Although the plan was unveiled to CIA, and it was in public knowledge. So I think I am actually supporting Francois's contention that the West is blind. West is selectively blind. The West, the geopolitical West has put blinkers on its eyes and does not see where the threat is coming from. Yes, there's a threat of jihadi terrorism that has been there, uh, appreciated by the West from September 11, 2001. But the West does not understand the relationship between Chinese hegemony, Chinese imperialism, and the role of jihadi terrorism. And that is what Francois was trying to point out. And that is exactly what Samuel Huntington said. If you read his book, he talks about an alliance between cynic civilization and Islamic civilization in the coming clash between the democratic Western civilization and Indic civilization. The lines that were drawn by Samuel Huntington are very clear, but it is not clear to the West. They are spending their energies trying to rationalize the Pakistani situation or Afghan situation. They don't realize that the leopard never changes its spots. In Afghanistan, Taliban 2.0 is no different from Taliban 1.0. Despite their claims of moderation, despite their claims of being much more civilized, being able to speak English and be able to negotiate with U.S. State Department mandarins, Taliban will remain the same. You have left $85 billion of armaments in Afghanistan, which is going to percolate into Pakistan and into India in a terrorist attack. And yes, China is fomenting all that. And I think the major players in the West do not appreciate. So I am very, very thankful to Francois to try to bring this fresh perspective to light for international relations expert and geopolitical experts that the real threat lies from China. And Francois, it is not just France that does not appreciate it or United States appreciates it. But it's my own country that does not appreciate it. India does not appreciate the threat coming from China. We have been in a delusion of, you know, two Asian giants and brotherly relations without realizing what China is. China is a hegemonic power that poses a threat to the entire world. And I think we need to understand because China has taken all the steps, whether supporting Pakistan, in various international fora, you know, literally giving the nuclear weapon uh, bomb to Pakistan. People don't know that Pakistan conducted the, its first nuclear test in China in 1990. China had given actually highly enriched uranium to Pakistan at that time. So the relationship linkage between Chinese hegemony, Chinese imperialistic plans for the entire world, and Islamic concept of Ummah, which is transnational. You have two terror spreading nodules who are in bed with each other, and each of them thinks that eventually they will be able to dominate the world. Islamic uh, jihadi terrorism, by the concept of transnational concept of Ummah or Caliphate, 
in China as the middle kingdom that is destined to rule the world. So those are the comments I am making because we had some time, our zoo did not join. But we will now revert to questions and answers. And I know that there are number of questions in the chat function. I will try to take at least one question from one individual. There are multiple questions by several individuals. So in order to be fair and balanced, I will try to, uh, uh, you know, indulge everyone who has asked a question. So if somebody has five questions, I will try to at least take one question, if not all five. So, Question from Saptarishi Basu is Pakistan is the epicenter of global terrorism. Why the United States is arming Pakistani army? And between Francois and Walter, either of you or both of you may answer this question. So, can I? Can I Walter, answer. Walter, please answer. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, ha having worked in the State worked Department, in the State 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 context with it. Um, so the question is, uh, and Pakistan, uh, given the threat, keep in mind that he is well aware of the problems of Pakistan and, uh, and the problems of Afghanistan. And in fact, keep in mind, that the president has not called Pakistan or the Pakistani leadership since coming to office, what, 18 months ago? Uh, and that's really quite unusual that there has been no call from the U.S. president at all. Second is to keep in mind about the U.S. fear. There is a U.S. fear of Chinese growth, hence the support of Quad. And around the Quad, there's a whole range, which I'm sure all of you know, of subsidiary agreements as well. And, and all of them have a focus on Afghanistan. Now, I, there's only one other thing I want to say, and it's not directly related to this, is that um, the uh, Problem of China linkages with the terrorist groups. I'm sure there are some, you know, taking place. But the two ideologies are diametrically opposed to each other. At some point, there's going to be, in fact, there already is a clash in some areas. There's a basic clash between godless communism and 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 an orthodox Islam that the Taliban represent. And I can tell you from Chinese context, because until a few years ago, I taught at a Chinese university in Shanghai, Chengji. And, you know, there is real concern among Chinese strategists over what's happening, uh, you know, uh, to, to fortify the, uh, a kind of radical Islam, because they have a, a strong Islamic population in the west of China as well. And you probably and know you probably that know for which the, which the, the West and the U.S. have held them responsible is locking up, you know, uh, Muslims for quote unquote re-education because of the fear of growing Islamic fundamentalism, which I think is true. There is growing Islamic fundamentalism in West China. And that they clearly recognize is a problem. So they've got a problem in how they react uh, to, uh, to the, to the uh, incidents and to what of, of Islamic strength. And to what extent, to what extent uh, that this yeah, connection this needs connection to be sustained, sustained is something that they have to work out. Because it's not because all, it's not you know, all favorable, favorable uh, to, them, uh, to them strategically. Franzo, please go ahead. Same question. Um, you know, I mean, it's not only the United States. Uh, am I audible? Am I audible? Yes, you are. You are. Uh, it's not not only United States. It's the United Nations also. Uh, because uh, to declare Pakistan as a terrorist state, though I'm not an expert, I think it would start. Uh, it would have to be uh, sourced from the uh, from the United Nations. And, and China will also of course vote it because. I one of the five, uh, of the five uh, Security Council Security members, Council which are the bit of power. Now, I, I don't know where it will happen, happen, frankly speaking. Frankly speaking. Uh, 
But I, I, as you said, you know, I'm more concerned about China. I'm more concerned that the world realizes the danger that China represents because it cynically uses economic terrorism uh, to further its uh, uh, hegemonic uh, aims. Let me say that again. The danger that China represents, one of the dangers, that it cynically, cynically uses Islamic, uses Islamic terrorism. terrorism when it when China itself is facing Islamic, Islamic terrorism, terrorism, terrorism though, though for the moment, for the moment it has managed it to clamp on, on, on its own Muslim minority, Muslim putting, minority them putting them in prediction camps. We know, camp, know that. So whatever the fault of Islam, the fault of Islam, 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 Islam has no Islam fear, has fear when it comes to its faith. The, the fact that China is using China cynically Islamic, Islamic terrorism to further its same against India particularly, India particularly um, is, is much, much more reprehensible than Pakistan, who is a Muslim nation and believe in Islam, believe in the Quran, though they can be, though they can be excused in a very, in a very minute, minute, minute manner, minute but China, manner, but what China is doing is inexcusable. What is more inexcusable? I know I'm straying away a little bit from the, from the question. Is that, uh, is that uh, India is not India seeing it either? either. It's it not that, uh, that you know, uh, India is more enlightened about China's, 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 policy and uh, I don't see much different though there is a little bit to be honest uh, with the present government of Mr. Narendra Modi than that previous government so I don't see in the future that Pakistan will be designated as a terrorist outfit because of China pressure because of presence of China but I'm more concerned about the world recognizing the fact that China is using Islamic terrorism in a cynical manner uh, to further it Thank you, Francois. There uh, is another question as a follow up on this uh, by Ankush Mandari. I will read that, but I will just have a rejoinder here uh, and interject between Francois and Walter because Walter said that, you know, how can the fundamentalist Islamic forces be in bed with godless communists? You know, there is a saying in geopolitics that enemy of your enemy is your friend. Both are trying to defeat so-called democratic structures or democratic alliance of countries, whether that is represented by West or by India. And both of them have their own calculations. So tactically, this is a tactical alliance, not so much of a strategic alliance, because both want to dominate the world. And at this point in time, both are trying to work together in unison. You know, I would not call current Chinese regime as godless communists. They, it is, you know, their socialism is with Chinese characteristics. It bends, it's fluids, you know, to the extent they, will, they would allow, you know, private capital to come you know, three represents, the theory of three represents that was, uh, you know, supported by Jiang Zemin. Uh, and now, of course, with Xi Jinping thought of China dream. China dream is an imperialist dream with China as the, at the center of the, as the middle kingdom and the, all the vassal states at the periphery kowtowing to China. China has already established a post box, a post office in space on its, you know, space station. China is claiming the entire world. It is claiming the North Pole. It is claiming the Northern, uh, you know, route. It is claiming the entire South China Sea. It says Indian Ocean is not India's ocean. It has established bases. China is doing deep sea mining in Indian Ocean approved by United Nations. I think we need to wake up and open our eyes that the, the tactical alliance between Islamic civilizational forces or Islamic transnational Islamic imperialistic forces and Chinese imperialism is there to see 
and it is working in tandem and in unison. And unfortunately, our friends in the West do not understand that. I'll go to the next question. And this is from Ankush Bhandari, and it's a follow up question. Franzo has already asked, uh, answered about terrorist state. Question is when Pakistan would be put on the blacklist of FATF? It has been on gray list, and attempts have been made to get it out of the gray list. Actually, Pakistan deserves to be on the blacklist of FATF because of it is continued financing of terror, continued jihadi activities. So question goes to both of you, Francois and Walter, whoever wants to answer first. Francois, go ahead. Okay. okay. Um, you know, I, I, I don't want, I'm I'm gonna, gonna, I believe in a better I world. Better like all of us. I'm an idealistic man. I, I don't believe that the world is a cartoon of good and bad. And it's more complicated than that. I, I don't think that the US is turning Pakistan out of an evil, you know, motive uh, to, you know, to belittle India or to damage India. I don't believe that. In my country, France, and other European countries, I see that the West is desperately looking for a moderate Islam to die out. I'll say that again. In France and in other Western countries, the West is desperately looking for moderate Islam, which is able to have a you know dialogue with it. Now, now wrongly of course yes, and sometimes course. cynically, and sometimes cynically uh, the us has believed that US pakistan, believe that pakistan is one of these moderate states. And I, I myself, I having been to Pakistan, Pakistan, you know, I interviewed Benazir Bhutto twice. Uh, especially with a woman in a man's world. Man's world. Uh, Pakistan is a man's is world, a man's you know, man's know, world, you know where, 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 where women are mostly are mostly inside. I'm talking inside about the, the, the average, average you know, countryside woman, not the educated the Lahore country woman. And Benazir Bhutto, the highly educated person, uh, I, I have interviewed her, she was sitting in her office, she was sitting on a chair, and all the men were standing you know, in a very obsequious manner with her fans. So, Yes, you know, yes, Pakistan you know, looks Pakistan like a moderate country, country when you go there. People, uh, people uh, as I said, you know, politicians are actually different. People are friendly. Uh, so, so, so one can be, one can be, you know, misled. One can be misled. I think the, the U.S. has been misled. Uh, Pakistan has been able to hire powerful lobbies in the U.S. You know, uh, Pakistanis, Pakistanis, Americans, you know, have been able to lobby the Congress people against India. I see again and again concerns on Kashmir and the U.S., where mostly the anti-Indian speakers. So, so, so I, I don't think that there's a very conscious motive inside that you know, the U.S. wants to expand Pakistan so that you know it bombs India. I think. Well, I know I'm going to go in an unknown territory. I think there are forces in the world. No, sure, no, I'm a disciple of Shirokindo. I have the great privilege of meeting the mother, his companion, who was French and to read Shirokindo extensively. Uh, now, this year is the year of the 150th anniversary of Shirokindo. Shirokindo was not only a great yogi, a great philosopher, he was the first Indian who wanted to put out the British, the British with violence. He I mean, said with violence in the spirit of the Bhagavad Gita. So Shirobino said that the forces, the world is a battle of forces, of occult forces. He called this occult, invisible forces. There are dharmic forces, no forces for the good, and there are forces which, you know, want to plant humanity into disorder, or into obscurity. So, so, so these forces are active, and definitely they have influence. I'm talking about the authoric forces. The anti good the anti Islamic forces. Definitely, definitely, they have influenced the United States. States. They continue supporting Pakistan. Pakistan. With the external, external uh, uh, you know, 
phenomenon that I'm talking about, I'm talking about, about Pakistan being much better than India in terms of relationship, in terms of, you know, uh, lobbying, in terms of, you know, coming across as nice people. Indians are no good. You know? I mean, I, I'm sorry to say that Indian politicians, you know, and Indian writers and Indian intelligence have, have no interest in propping up their country, you know, in, in, in helping the West to understand better the, the wonder that is India, you know, the wonder that is India, not only in terms of geostrategic position, so in terms of people, of a people you know, who are so tolerant, who are so human, who understand that God manifests Thanks, Prashua, you, you are going actually slightly different from the question, but before I invite Walter to answer the same question about why Pakistan is not on FATF blacklist, I will add a supplementary question for Walter. And this supplementary question is from Atul Kulkarni, who says, is the West, aka United States, really willing to see India in its real form or just wants it to be a punching bag in the international arena? Walter, go ahead. Uh, 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 on the first, uh, the first issue you issue brought up, you there brought is a debate in the debate government that, and uh, has long has been long about been whether, uh, you know, Pakistan, Pakistan should, be should be listed because, because of, support. of support. Now, there's been there's a reluctance, been a reluctance to, do so to do so for strategic, strategic reasons, and there is a debate is a about the validity of it, whether to do so and uh, work uh, against work the interests of the moderates in, in Pakistan. It's too bad you didn't have a speaker coming from Pakistan. There is something of a debate in Pakistan, including how to react to terrorism. And I can tell you that because of the TPP, the support it's giving, and uh, in, in Pakistan, Pakistan to radicals, there, there is an element in Pakistan, in Pakistan which Pakistan. feels that this is a danger, and there is some and support, is some support you know, in Pakistan for working with the U.S. How, how to confront a very real a issue, very real issue. Country, because you have madrasas and you have, and you have uh, mosques uh, in, in Pakistan who, um, who support, support the radical the elements, but it's not everybody who does. There is a debate, and we need to take advantage of those who are opposed. Uh, to, to uh, a radical, a radical turn, turn to the extent turn, that they can. That they can. Now, India plays a role. Plays India a role. is the India only is country the only in South Asia, Asia that has a prosperous has a economy. Prosperous it's growing at the, at the, at the rate of 8% a year, highest in the world. Highest in the world. And it's likely to continue growth rate, rate, according to some predictions, some predictions at 5 to 6%, to 6%, which is a very high growth rate. Half the politicians in the United States would give their right arm to have a growth rate that high. Now, therefore, it's in a position to assert influence in a, in a continent which has desperate problems. And the Chinese, interestingly enough, have not been willing to provide that kind of assistance, either to Pakistan or to uh, Afghanistan. And the, and the Chinese have a problem wherever they work. And I know these, this from my Chinese colleagues in Tongji uh, and, um, and at Fudan, uh, who, one who is, well, I won't get into that, um, you know, who argue to me that, you know, they, you know, there's a real suspicion of Pakistan in Chinese circles because of, of you know, there have been attacks on uh, uh, on Chinese individuals and projects in Pakistan and in, uh, you know, in, in, in the border areas in particular, but other places as well. And there is a sense among, you know, many in China that Pakistan is a weak state and therefore, you know, not sure how to respond to it. And they recognize that India is a strong and growing state and therefore they have to react to it. And in world politics, anyone who's worked in world and in, in international politics knows that the political leadership, you know, carefully surveys the strength of a country, both judged by its economics as well as by its military. On, on both of those, Pakistan comes out badly and Afghanistan even worse. There is a threat that the danger in that part of the world is going to leap over the border, which it has to a certain extent done. I remember when I was in the State Department, you had these training institutes for Al-Qaeda and other groups, which were practicing what they were doing in, you know, in uh, uh, Kashmir and in the Central Asian republics to a certain extent. There is a sense that these, uh, in not only a sense, it's, it's based on fact that these groups are a threat. They're a threat to stability in South Asia and the Chinese, I, I can tell you, recognize that they, they represent a threat there as well. Now, 
you know, people have said that the Chinese uh, are making use of it, and probably to a certain extent, that's true. Countries do that sort of thing. Um, and but I but at the end of the day, what you have in uh, uh, in among the Chinese communists and what you have, you know, among the Taliban are two diametrically opposite ideologies. Now, I, I know when I was in China, a, a Christian group of students asked me to speak. I'm not all that good a Christian, but I am a Lutheran by background. Um, and uh, my colleagues said, don't do it uh, because it will get you into trouble, you know, uh, and some of your colleagues may get into trouble too if you do it, uh, do this sort of thing. So maybe as a coward, I decided not to do it. Um, now, what well, well, the second question you had? Question you had. I yeah. think I think we can go now to Francois because we have to take a couple of more questions. So we don't want to. Francois, you want to say anything on that question about you know why West is using India as a punching bag? Uh, please unmute yourself. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I, I wanted to say yeah, something. To say okay, something sorry. That. Uh, uh, there is one mind. question I would like to answer. If you have time, if you have time. Uh, Okay, go ahead. Why does India accept the one China policy uh, while doesn't accept the one while China doesn't accept the one India policy? Do I have time to answer that question? Can't hear you. Can't uh, hear. Yeah. Are you talking to me? Please, or go, or ahead. Or? Please go ahead. Okay, uh, you know, it's, it's something that has bothered me for a long time. Uh, because uh, even recently, uh, when, uh, you know, when, when Taiwan, uh, um, you know, made a near attack, on, uh, when uh, China did a near attack on Taiwan after the visit of the U.S. Secretary of State, uh, India was uh, one of the few countries which didn't condemn uh, China uh, for 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 this and 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 it saddened me because uh, China would have no qualms in doing the uh, you know the opposite for India. Now um, I I wanted to say a few words about Tibet. You know we talk about China, but we never talk about Tibet and the Dalai Lama. Um, India has one Trump, you know, one, one card Trump in his hand. It's the Dalai Lama. Uh, because if there's one thing that makes the Chinese very upset and lose their cool and lose their balance of mind, it is the, the very, you know, when you pronounce only the word of the Dalai Lama. Now, the Dalai Lama is living in India. He's 86. Uh, and, and, you know, he's an inextraordinary weapon because it would be enough for India to say, we do not recognize uh, Tibet as part of China and, and recognize the Dalai Lama as the uh, spiritual and, and political leader of, of, uh, of Tibet. And do you know that 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 would be an extraordinary uh, level against the Chinese, but but India doesn't dare do that. I mean, the Modi government barely doesn't, Mr. Modi doesn't even wish, he wishes Indira Gandhi on her birthday, Indira Gandhi who wanted him killed uh, when he was Gujarat chief minister, he wished on a birthday, but he never wished the Dalai Lama was a wonderful man, you know, whatever. I'm not a Buddhist, you know, but he's such a wonderful person, uh, such a compassionate person, such a patient person. Now, when he dies, you know, this Trump is gone, you know, this this, uh, this card is gone because the Chinese will name their own Dalai Lama. Everything will become very confused. There'll be two Dalai Lamas and the Chinese will have the ultimate upper hand. Now, why doesn't India, why does India recognize, you know, uh, China claim on Taiwan and Tibet? I do not understand. You know, I, I'm so disappointed. Uh, Mr. Modi has been, he's one of the most hated men in the world. And uh, still today, after going out of his way to, to woo everybody, the US, the Chinese, everybody. Uh, and uh, he's hated because he's supposed to be, uh, you know, a militant Hindu, uh, you know, a dangerous man. But you have this China and, and, and his attitude is no better than the, than the Congress, you know, no, no better. There is no difference. No difference. Okay. So, yes, uh, yes, yes. Can't be be I can't answer it. Uh, I'll take one last question because we are coming to an end. Uh, and it's a question in a slightly different direction. It is from Anushri. What is the future of ancient indigenous traditions that have managed to survive in the Afpak region? like Kalash culture in Pakistan, 
and Shaiva and Nath communities in Afghanistan. Either of the speakers, if you have any. I'm not an expert on that. I have a colleague. I have a colleague who works on that issue. Um, the, uh, it's not just in South Asia, but it's uh, worldwide. These traditional uh, cultures have, uh, have not fared well. Uh, 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 in this kind of modern, kind of era. modern era, and I think and you see that I in South Asia as South well. Asia There's been a collapse been a because, because of the spread of education, the spread of, spread of communications, the increased the travel, increased and travel, getting a more getting homogenous more cultural homogenous situation. situation, and that's a fact. That's a and fact. I don't think this has been this you know, orchestrated by anybody. Orchestrated it's just taking place because of the rules of modernization. Okay, I will probably give a response that Kalash culture in Pakistan is under threat because of forced Islamic conversion. Uh, it's a fact. And Afghanistan under Taliban and last 30 years of you know, various waves of Islamic regimes has pretty much obliterated the non-Islamic faiths from that country. So the answer is that world is silently watching, world is watching with blind eyes when Taliban 1.0 blasted Bamiyan Buddhas. So word is not actually bothered by what happens to small, non-Semitic, Eastern ancient traditions, and that's the reality. So that being the last question, we are going to end this very productive discussion, very wide ranging. I'm thankful to both our uh, distinguished panelists Mr. Francois Gautier, as well as Professor Walter Anderson. Professor Walter Anderson is no stranger to this forum. He has been on this platform before. My hope is that Francois will come back over and over again in future on this platform in various capacities. I'm also thankful to our audience who on a Saturday morning here in US, you know, taking one and a half hour of your time to join this discussion it requires very rare individuals who will sacrifice their weekend. I'm also thankful to Team CSA, Mr. Ripudaman Pachauri and Ankush Bhandari, who work on the background to make these sessions a possibility. With those comments, I thank everyone. We shall be back again in two weeks time for our distinguished lecture series, and we will have another round table discussion in the month of October on second Saturday. Thank you everyone. The recording would be available in 24 hours. Namaskar and, you know, hope we can conquer global terrorism with a, you know, insight that is not so overtly present at this point in time. Thank you very much indeed to all of you.